tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I kind of was expecting it, to be honest. The pushback begins. B.C. businesses already facing criticism as they get ready to ask for proof of vaccination. Also. We have to be careful about who is exposed in person. Family doctors call for a balanced approach as they're urged to return to in-person visits. And. What happened to me was so catastrophic. A life by miracle. Now, the warning from a mission man who nearly died of a drug overdose. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. So with a week before the vaccine card system comes into effect, some businesses are already facing pushback from customers. And as Isabel Regam explains, there's worry over who will face the brunt of the frustrations. I kind of was expecting it, to be honest. And It wasn't long after Ratio Coffee and Pastry shared staff are gearing up to ask for proof of vaccination that the business received pushback and angry messages. Justice, we can't serve liquor to 15-year-olds. Um, you know, we need to abide by this public health order. Andrew McWilliams says come next week, staff will be asking to see vaccine cards for dine-in and table service guests, but not for takeout. But he acknowledges not all coffee shops will be doing the same, especially those that only do counter service. And it's leading to some patchwork of rules in the food and beverage industry. It's going to be a challenging time for restaurant owners and for staff of, you know, my staff of my restaurants. I would certainly love for them not to have to have conflict with customers like that, but um, unfortunately expecting a little bit of it. There are also some unknowns for municipalities operating recreation centres. While some say they will be using the system, the City of Vancouver today said it could not provide an interview because details are still being worked through as staff see clarity. Hotel operators are also seeking some answers. There was so many questions. The BC Hotel Association says uncertainty last week around rules for the use of pools, gyms and other facilities by guests has since been clarified by the Ministry of Health. If those areas within a hotel are not open to the public, so they're there for guests of the hotel, Nobody needs to be at the door checking your vaccine passport. Vaccination status will, however, be checked at restaurants, lounges and conference rooms with more than 50 guests. And there are still concerns over the pushback staff may face. At no time have we supported that enforcement is a frontline employee uh, responsibility. It's why she says she was happy to hear the province saying police officers and other officials would have that role. People are chatting and trying to figure out how they're going to approach it. Nick Williams says there's still many unknowns when it comes to the app and the rollout, but the pushback is something he already knows he's going to have to tackle. Isabel Regam, CBC News, Vancouver. And BC's fourth wave is hitting a bumpy plateau in daily cases as today's count has once again gone above 800. Thankfully, no one has died from COVID-19 since yesterday. More people were sent to hospital, though, now up to 261 with almost half in intensive care. Around 80 percent of those hospitalized this past week are unvaccinated. My body, my choice. More anti-vaccine card rallies took place around B.C. today, not at hospitals this time, but protesters still blocked major roads. In Vancouver, they showed up at City Hall, stopping traffic on Canby Street for some time. The crowd chanted, lock her up, directed at Provincial Health Minister Dr. Bonnie Henry. And while these anti-vaccine card rallies had people showing up in droves, new poll numbers show the majority of British Columbians actually hold the opposite view. 72% support proof of vaccination in public spaces. If someone refuses to present a vaccine card, 46% of British Columbians feel they should be escorted off the premises. 28% feel they should be fined and 16% feel they should be arrested or charged. When it comes to medically treating the unvaccinated, British Columbians are divided. 49% feel people who choose not to get vaccinated should get lower priority in medical treatment, while the other 51% feel vaccination status should not be a factor in medical triage.
And another major company ordering all of its employees to be vaccinated. WestJet Airlines saying everyone working for the company must have both doses by October 30th. The Western-based airline says medical or other exemptions will be evaluated and accommodated, but testing will not be allowed as an alternative to vaccination. Any employee who does not comply will be put on unpaid leave or fired. Air Canada announced a mandatory vaccination policy for its employees in late August. Well, since the pandemic started, 90% of doctors' visits have actually happened virtually. And now, as the B.C. government urges physicians to go back to in-person care, Eva Yuguen-Senge is finding out that's caused some fear for both doctors and patients. We need to make sure that we have the right balance between in-person and, and virtual care because some things simply can't be done. Uh, virtually. It's been a year and a half since BC doctors moved nearly all their appointments to the screen. And for many patients, that model has worked. It takes a long time for me to get to my doctor's office because I don't have a car and so I have to take transit um, and also expose myself on transit potentially to COVID. Um, so yeah, so it was really great to have virtual appointments. Some feel it puts the responsibility on the patient to self-diagnose. So if the doctor notices a limp or something like that, um, but the patient doesn't say anything, uh, that's where an in-person appointment would be far better, realistically. BC doctors have received a letter from the Ministry of Health saying given broad vaccination coverage, COVID-19 should no longer pose a barrier to in-person practice. And with appropriate measures in place, they expect all practitioners to resume routine in-person visits based on clinical needs and patient preferences. But healthcare professionals say there needs to be a balance between diagnosing. What we want to see is more in-person care for those, uh, for those issues that require in-person care. So certain types of screening maneuvers, cancer uh, screening and prevention, um, uh, examination. And preventing transmission. We have to provide care to the most medically vulnerable people. And so we have to be careful about who is exposed in person in our, in our clinics and in our waiting rooms. 97% of BC doctors have been fully vaccinated and the vast majority of them have returned to in-person care or a hybrid model. Not all care has to be offered in person and to have to take hours out of your day to get some very simple medical care, which is what had to happen before, is um, very inconvenient and also a barrier for people. At the end of the day, most patients and physicians agree virtual care shouldn't be completely thrown out. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, police officers face all sorts of challenges in their duties, from verbal abuse to life-threatening encounters. But the Vancouver Police Department says it's seeing a troubling trend of people who seem to have gained confidence in attacking officers. Just this past long weekend, almost a dozen officers were hurt. Den Burrett joins us live with more on this. Den, first off, what sort of attacks are we talking about here? Spitting, blood, tackling, and stitches, among a few things. The VPD says 11 officers were injured over the Labor Day long weekend. On Sunday, police say three officers were injured after being called to a grocery store where staff reported a man acting violently. One had blood spat on him. On Monday, the force says a woman allegedly spat in an officer's face as they read her her charter rights, so that officer was taken to hospital to check for any diseases. That same day, the VPD says the brother of a suspect involved in a domestic fight tackled an officer and elbowed another in the head. The force says the weekend injuries follow a bigger trend of increased violence against officers. The department says between January and July of this year, 108 officers were attacked in the city, which it says is a 64% increase from 2018. It says its members understand the job they signed up for does come with some risk. However, what we are continuing to see throughout the city is a disturbing number of people who uh, appear to be uh, emboldened or feel entitled to uh, put uh, the safety of police officers at risk while our officers, our frontline officers, are simply out trying to do their job. Vancouver's mayor, who chairs the police board, says all frontline workers, from healthcare workers to firefighters, are facing extraordinary circumstances right now. It was a week ago, thousands of people opposed to va COVID vaccinations clogged streets in Vancouver, Kelowna, Victoria, Kamloops, and other cities. One health authority said someone assaulted a health worker that day, while other leaders said patients were slowed from getting health care safely. 
folks uh, come and do their jobs and then they want to go home safe and sound, uh, it's unacceptable for for uh, anyone to be assaulting any public servants, anybody. Uh, so that has to stop. Uh, I'm glad the police have brought this to our attention because uh, sometimes the strain of, of COVID is, is uh, not as understood as it should be. Stewart says assaults against police officers ought to be fully pursued so people don't do it again. Anita. Dan Burt reporting live for us tonight. Thank you. After nearly dying from an overdose, a mission man is warning others to get help before it's too late. As Benit Brach reports, illicit drugs are now the number one thing killing young people in B.C. A beautiful family moment far different from three years ago. What happened to me was so catastrophic. Eris Finch was found in his mission apartment, unconscious and blue. Cocaine laced with fentanyl had him in a coma for 23 days at the age of 31. Seizures, organs failing and brain swelling. Right from the beginning, as soon as he got into the uh, uh, emergency, we were being told he probably won't survive. Horrific for any parent to see. I hoped, I still, I didn't give up hope that he would survive. And by miracle, he did. Finch is now working toward becoming sober. But my advice is to go see a specialist because there is a lot of them and there is care for you that that um, is willing and ready to, to help you out of whatever mess that you're in and try to get your life back on track. Push aside the stigma, he says, and get the help you need. I just, I can't, I can't go back or even open the door that leads back to that place. Now Finch gets monthly support from the Rapid Access Addiction Clinic at St. Paul's Hospital. Addiction experts say awareness around overdose prevention is critical right now as BC's drug crisis reaches new heights. A person who is using illicit drugs needs to recognize that one of the main reasons why overdoses occur is because it's extremely difficult to predict the concentration of the drug. Other important advice, never use alone. Get your drugs checked at prevention sites if you can, and always carry naloxone. You love me, sweetheart. And as Finch continues his journey towards sobriety, he has a new motivation. I can see my progression in her eyes as she grows up. His daughter, born while he fought for his life in a coma, something he hopes he'll never be doing again. Benit Brach, CBC News, Vancouver. Acts of Islamophobia continue to be a grave concern for Muslim communities, including here in B.C., where just last week a Langley mosque received a threatening racist letter. But the issue has barely been a mention during the federal election campaign. As Rafi Bujakanian reports, the party's silence has been deafening to reeling communities. Our community has been living in this new normal for quite some time. That new normal? Islamophobia uglier than ever. Take this letter sent to the Langley Islamic Center, warning it to shut down and glorifying both Hitler and the killer behind the New Zealand mosque shooting of 2019. We all expect to be able to pray freely. We expect to be able to put a signboard up outside of our Islamic Center so that, you know, we can tell everybody that we're here. Three months ago, all major party leaders showed up at a vigil in London, Ontario, commemorating the Afzal family, four of them killed in what police called an Islamophobic attack. We hold you in our thoughts. We will not cower in fear. This entire community and this entire country stands with you. But the National Council of Canadian Muslims points out the subject barely come up on the campaign trail. I don't understand what more needs to happen. This summer, it issued 60 recommendations to Ottawa, including creating a special envoy on Islamophobia and a commitment to fight Quebec secularism law in court. Bill 21 prevents provincial public sector workers from wearing religious symbols. If my wife travels with me to Quebec. She can't become a prosecutor. No major party is making that commitment, but they all want to create new online hate legislation. 
though the Conservatives have had to field questions about omitting the word Islamophobia from their platform. Well, we're going to be working with the National Council, with, with other organizations. The main three parties have all just issued statements condemning hatred. Still, the National Council of Canadian Muslims would like to see them start talking about Islamophobia on the campaign trail. Rafi Bujikani, CBC News, Ottawa. Protesters are calling on Canada's political candidates to make the climate crisis a priority in the fall election as well. You really want to put this climate action at the forefront of every political party's campaign so that that is the number one issue getting talked about. The downtown protest was coordinated by the environmental movement 350 Canada. Canada's six major parties have all proposed climate change plans within their election platforms. Protesters at the rally pledged to keep politicians accountable for campaign promises. They stress summer's unprecedented heat waves and devastating wildfires mean the government needs to act swiftly. Without a planet, we don't have anything. This is the most important thing that we can be focusing on. They have to take immediate and drastic steps, and we have to start paying way more taxes to fix this. I got, what, 50 more years on this earth? It's only going to get worse unless we act now. The event is one of 64 across Canada trying to bring climate to the forefront of this election. Time now for a look at the forecast with meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. Uh, Joe, a bit of a mixed bag today, and I didn't mind it, I have to say. I didn't mind it either, Anita. Yeah, we could do this. Some showers in the morning, sunshine and warm temperatures in the afternoon. In fact, let's do it again tomorrow. I think I got <laughs> one more in the bag. Uh, let's take a look first at the temperatures we hit across the South Coast today because it was a warm one. We were actually five degrees above our seasonal mark for most of Metro Vancouver, which is now about 19 for this time of the year, although that is based on our past 20 year average and that does need to get updated. I'm sure that number has bumped up with climate change, uh, but we are still above that seasonal mark nonetheless with 25s, 21 for Victoria. And you can see as we head over towards the interior, high 20s, not quite hitting that 30 degree mark, but watching the fire danger rating with dry conditions as well. The moisture that we're getting hitting the south coast over the next 24 hours. This is actually the system that brought us the showers early this morning. We saw those showers right across uh, the island as well, sort of between 6 and 10 a.m. That center of low is going to track across the island through the day tomorrow. So it'll bring us cloud cover and the slight risk for a morning shower in, in Vancouver. It's also going to bring in a southerly flow. So I wanted to show you the Smoky Skies Bulletin that has expanded now to the Kootenays. And that is because of the fires south of the border. So watching for smoky skies. Uh, for us in Vancouver, though, this is uh, another mixed bag day. I'll take you through the timing, but I think we've got another sunny afternoon. And Anita, I count at least four more summer days in the forecast. I'll break them down coming up. I'm loving that. And I got to say, as someone who's uh, itching to travel right now, I'm really digging the flight attendant look. <laughs> Exits are here and here, Anita. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. <laughs> And thank you for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. I'm your host, Anita Bath. And if you're not already doing it, you can always watch our program live on our free app, CBC Gem. You can also catch us on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. The French language leaders debate for the five major Canadian leaders is happening right now. It's ahead of tomorrow's debate in English. What to watch for next. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. A Saskatchewan woman who volunteered to donate part of her liver to save a stranger's life made a life saving discovery about herself instead. As Bonnie Allen explains, she now has a new mission. These were happier times for Cindy Harris, but six years later, the woman from Airdrie, Alberta, is fading from liver disease, heavily medicated, sitting on a transplant list. I go to my my doctor every couple of months and he his words are we have to find you a new liver so in february her children put out a desperate plea on facebook a province over a stranger crystal walker clicked on it and was called to act there was something that spoke to me something bigger than me that i can't even explain so i made the call and 48 hours later the transplant team the coordinator called me and said okay let's talk Walker agreed to donate part of her liver to Harris. The liver regenerates in a matter of weeks. In April, Walker drove to Edmonton for days of testing. 
We got about 20 minutes away from the hospital and the secretary called me and she said, hey, Krista, our radiologist just called and our radiologist doesn't just call and they see something suspicious on your left kidney. Walker's mother had died of kidney cancer at the age of 41. A surgeon quickly removed Walker's tumor and she's now cancer free. His exact words were to me, you are so lucky. He said, Krista, people don't just go for a random CT or a random MRI. He said, you were trying to give somebody the gift of life. And, you know, she turned around and gave it right back to you. Walker's brush with cancer means she can no longer donate her liver. Disappointing to both women, but Walker is not giving up. And I said to them, boy, you told the wrong person no, because when I get up on a soapbox, I don't get off real easy because this lady needs a liver. So you're, you're saying... I can't give it to her, but I'm going to find somebody who can. That's my quest, and I'm not going to stop. Six months ago, I didn't know this woman and her family, and now she is right up there with my family. Their connection has already saved one of their lives. Now they're determined to save them both. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. The trial has started today for 20 suspects accused in the 2015 terrorist attacks in Paris. 130 people died almost six years ago after multiple suicide bombers and gunmen attacked targeted locations around the city. As Tessa Arcilia reports, this will be a trial of unprecedented scale. What's being described as the biggest trial in France's modern history, set to last for nine months, began today. It's a trial of unprecedented scale. More than 300 lawyers, 1,800 plaintiffs, including survivors and victims' relatives, and in attendance, 14 of the 20 defendants. Among them, the most high-profile suspect, Salah Abdeslam. Believed to be the lone survivor of a group of gunmen and suicide bombers that directly carried out the attacks. Abdeslam was arrested in this neighborhood in Brussels after a four-month manhunt that ended in a shootout with police. Asked in court what his profession was, he said he's a soldier of Islamic State. Stefan Serrad, whose son was killed that night, speaks of the incredible loss. It's, first of all, a personal loss, because of the loss of a, of a child, my son. And it's also a collective loss. 130 people were killed that night, hundreds injured, thousands of lives appended. For this trial, a custom-designed modern courtroom that can house 550 people and 10 cameras. Video recordings are only allowed in French courts for cases considered to be of historical significance. This will just be the 13th trial recorded for the National Archives. For some families, the trial could reopen old wounds. But Sehad says being in court is about sending an important message to Abdeslam. It's very important for me to face him and to face the other and to say, OK, look at me. I'm there. I'm alive. My son is not there, but through me is still here. We are still standing. You didn't win. No trial can heal the pain, but some hope this will bring some closure to one of France's most painful tragedies. Tessa Arcilia, CBC News, London.
After a messy withdrawal from Afghanistan, the U.S. is looking to form a united front with its allies on how to deal with the Taliban. Yesterday's announcement about an interim government has been met with skepticism. We're assessing the announcement, but despite professing that a new government would be inclusive, the announced list of names consists exclusively of individuals who are members of the Taliban or their close associates and no women. Today, this graphic and unsourced video emerged from Kabul. It reportedly shows women protesting the new all-male government, but the group was forced to disperse after being beaten with whips. The Taliban has not responded to the allegations, but warned that such demonstrations are illegal. Well, Canadians go to the polls in just 12 days. The party leaders have less than two weeks to sway voters, but the next 48 hours could be decisive. The English language debate is tomorrow, and the French debate is underway at this very moment in an election that is tighter than some predicted. In the middle of a pandemic, why did Mr. Trudeau call an election? We need to work to fight the fourth wave, not on uh, having an election. Mr. O'Toole is saying that vaccination and testing is the same thing, but it's not at all the same thing. Why did you call elections, Mr. Trudeau? That was just one contentious moment so far. The only lingu English language debate is tomorrow. It's featuring all leaders and it begins at 6 p.m. Vancouver time right here on CBC. And we saw the federal leaders square off tonight in a French language debate. But once again, I just want to remind you tomorrow they'll have another go at it in English. That will mean CBC Vancouver will not have a newscast. The English language debate will take place at this time, 6 p.m. Pacific. The federal party leaders are in Gatineau, Quebec, answering questions submitted by Canadians across the country. And you can tune in through a range of CBC platforms wherever you are and however you want to watch or listen using CBC TV, CBC News Network, CBC Gem, CBC Radio or CBC Listen. Again, that English language debate is set for tomorrow in place of our broadcast. It's starting at 6 p.m. Pacific. Well, an election debate in Dawson Creek had to be cancelled over candidate safety concerns. The live election debate was supposed to take place yesterday night. Organizers, though, pulled the plug due to community unrest over COVID-19 public health orders. The local MLA and other elected officials and their families got threatening messages. Tensions are running high in Dawson Creek. One person was arrested at a protest last week in front of City Hall. And the Conservative Party has released a major part of its election platform, the detailed price tag behind some of its big promises. David Cochran walks us through the numbers and the reaction to the late drop on such a pivotal day. We have a very ambitious plan to get our country back on its feet. On Tuesday, Aaron O'Toole insisted his plan will grow the economy by at least 3% a year and balance the budget within a decade. But his platform contained no numbers to support that claim because, he said, the parliamentary budget officer was still costing it. We said we would have an update from the parliamentary budget officer. We will have that, I hope, shortly. That prompted the PBO to tweet a rebuttal, making clear we release these costing estimates on dates selected by the parties. The time the Conservatives selected was just two hours before the French language debate, with Aaron O'Toole unavailable to take questions and with no time for his rivals to crunch the numbers before the leaders faced off. Those numbers show $51 billion in new spending over the next five years, with the deficit falling to $24.7 billion, which is $7.3 billion lower than what the Liberals are projecting. But to do that, Conservatives will cancel the $10 a day childcare agreements the Liberals reached with most provinces. And then there's the fine print of this big promise. I have a plan that has been very transparent about giving an extra $60 billion to our public universal health care system. Only $3.6 billion of that comes by 2026. The remaining $55 billion is pushed off until at least a second or third Conservative term in office. The Conservatives argue their policies will deliver the economic jolt the country needs to pay for this plan and even more. 
les conservateurs. But that goal of 3% economic growth is nearly double what private sector economists say is likely or even possible, something the Liberals have been targeting. He's going to magically get the budget back to balance. He's not showing his work. He's not doing his homework. O'Toole is showing his work now, with less than two weeks until voting day. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Anti-mask, pandemic denier and racist Calgary mayoral candidate Kevin J. Johnston is going to jail again. He's been sentenced to 40 days for defying three judges' court orders. The orders were meant to keep Johnston away from public rallies and obey health restrictions, all things he refused to do. He was also ordered to pay $20,000 in legal costs to Alberta Health Services and must obey public health orders from now on. He'll serve his 40-day sentence over 10 weekends. That means he's out on the morning of Calgary's municipal election on October 18th. Johnston has yet to be sentenced in Ontario after pleading guilty to a hate crime last week. He's also awaiting trial in B.C. for an assault charge. Okay, so you're all ready to download your vaccine card, but you may have a few technical questions about how to do it and how to save it so you can easily use it. A technology expert is here to guide you through it next. First off, a bit of an explanation. Soccer pools in Great Britain. A person buys a ticket and marks down what he thinks the scores will be in a week's worth of matches. If he's right on all the scores, the prize money is large. Even getting most of the scores right still nets prize money. The new federal plan would see similar pools set up in Canada for baseball games in the summertime. And in the winter, pools on hockey games. No pools on the Canadian Football League, however. There's just not enough games in a week to justify it. The announcement of the new pool scheme was made in Ottawa today by the fitness and amateur sport minister, Jerry Regan. It is anticipated that the sports pool program will be operational by the fall of 1982. What it all comes down to is money. Regan estimates the pools will bring in as much as $50 million in profits in the first year alone. The money is earmarked for cultural programs, medical research, and sports development. News like that has sports people almost jumping for joy. But I think this is it's great. This is, the, to me, the most positive thing that's happened in amateur sport in, in years. And the kinds of figures that were speculated on here today certainly would, uh, would meet many of our needs. In the area. Not everyone is so enthusiastic. Steve Proprosky was the sports minister in the Joe Clark government. He got the federal government out of the lottery business. Proprosky says there's not much difference between the pools and the lotteries. And today's announcement, he claims, breaks the contract his government worked out with the provinces, giving them the right to operate lotteries. It's war, the gloves are off, it's going to be high sticking, and boy, are they going to be kicking them around. If Proprosky's prediction of a federal provincial war is true, then the first salvos were fired today in provincial capitals. Uh, what is going to happen with this particular agreement at this stage of the game, I, I don't really know. Uh, it's conceivable that this may be perceived as a breach of the contract. I also understand that uh, the only way they would get out of this agreement was with unanimous consent of the provinces and the federal government. Now they are breaking the agreement by entering this thing. Well, it would appear as though that is uh, their intention to re-enter the lottery business. And uh, we have an agreement with them now under which the provinces pay some $28 million uh, by virtue of the fact that we have assumed the lottery business. And uh, I'm very concerned that that really abuses that agreement. Still, Regan insists the sports pools are not lotteries and not an intrusion into provincial territory. In going into the sports pools, we will not be in competition with the provinces since this field is not presently occupied by any other government in Canada. Canadians spend about $1 billion a year on lotteries. There's a long history of federal provincial scraps over which level of government will get the lion's share of that money. Federal provincial relations are strained to near the breaking point these days. And this evening, Ontario's Recreation Minister Reuben Bates announced his government may seek a court injunction to prevent the federal sports pools program. Christopher Walmsley, CBC News, Ottawa. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It takes a long time for me to get to my doctor's office 
because I don't have a car and so I have to take transit um, and also expose myself on transit potentially to COVID. As the BC government urges doctors to go back to in-person care, there's some fear from patients and physicians. Doctors point to the fourth wave and exposing patients in the waiting room, but they also say some visits need to be in person and the hybrid model should continue. Just as we can't serve liquor to 15 year olds, um, you know, we need to abide by this public health order. A day after the province gave more details around vaccine cards, BC businesses are already facing backlash for planning to ask for proof of shot. A Vernon coffee shop says it's been getting angry messages. Meanwhile, if you are vaccinated and do want to get your card, you can go online to do that. Now, some seniors and others with less access to technology have said they're worried about BC's new vaccine card system. So how do we make sure that they don't get left behind? With me now is tech expert Graham Williams. Thanks for being on the show today. I was glad to be here. First off, what kind of barriers do you see for people who aren't so tech savvy or don't have access to technology? Well, if you're not feeling confident with technology, there are a few options that are available with you, especially as well if you don't have access to it. And the first thing is going to be the 800 number that the uh, BC government has provided for this. So as long as you've had your vaccine, it's been registered into the system, you don't need to worry about that back end. But what you do need is your provincial health number, uh, and you need to have your date of birth and your name. And when you call into that number, they'll be able to, one, take all of that data, verify that it's you, get a delivery address, and be able to send you a physical paper card. Um, that's going to really sort of take the technology aspect out of this. That's going to have the same QR code on it that your device would. Um, and so that's one way of dealing with it. If you have a friend or family member that can help you navigate that, you can actually print out the PDF because that QR code, it's not dependent on the device. The information is actually encoded uh, as far as the, the database record on that QR code, uh, and which then goes through to the secure da database, which is helpful in identifying you. And then, again, none of that data is stored uh, on the paper. None of that data is stored in the system of the person who's scanning you. It's all with, with the province, and that's one way of getting around that. But really, if words like QR code and PDF are scary to someone, they should just call that number and get it sent to their home. That's the best way to do it. How could this have been designed differently to make sure no one is left behind? Or do you think this is suffice, sufficient? To be honest, like looking at this system, this is a really elegantly designed system. I'm thinking of this and trying to see a way that could have been more uh, conducive to more people getting involved. And I really don't, I'm not seeing uh, a better way to do this right now. I'm actually very impressed with how the province has handled this. Everything from the queue it system that they've had for people trying to log in and get in. Uh, I mean, I've tried to buy a lot of concert tickets online. I've tried to buy a lot of things online. Um, and this is actually the best experience that I've had waiting in line. Uh, while trying to get something through the internet. So really well done on that front. Um, you know, looking at this right now, the vast majority of us have uh, phones or smartphones or tablets or devices that are capable of one, accessing the service and then two, connecting us to the service while we're out and about. So looking at this as a cohesive whole, I think it's, it's fairly well done. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about that, accessing the QR code when we are out and about. Let's say I have my cell phone. I don't want to actually log on and pull it out every time. How can I make life easier for myself? This is a question I've had a lot. And so one of the easiest things that you can do uh, is make sure that you are either taking a screenshot or saving that PDF onto your device. Now, once you've got that screenshot in your phone, uh, once you've got that image in your phone, a lot of people are saying, well, I don't have to scroll back to do that. Um, there's a few things that you can do on both Android and iPhone. You can favorite that image. Um, on the iPhone, it's basically you just click the little heart there and it will say that this is going into your favorites. There is an album specifically dedicated to that. Um, what I've done on my device is I've actually created an album called ID and I keep uh, copying my driver's license, my passport and, uh, and this QR code in there as well. It's secure because I've got two-factor authentication turned on with iCloud, so I feel fairly secure with how my device is handling that. Uh, for anyone who's not feeling confident about handing an unlocked device to someone, showing a picture and having them uh, be able to scroll through that, uh, one of the things that you can do is actually take that image and turn it into the wallpaper of your lock screen. And so essentially you just go into your settings, go to your wallpaper settings, choose that image and have that display on the lock screen. That means you don't have to unlock your phone, you just have to wake it up, put it in front of the person, they can scan that with the device and they'll be able to get that QR code from there without the phone having to leave your hand or without you having to unlock it. Good advice, some stuff I didn't think about and I will be doing. Tech expert Graham Williams, thanks for being here today. Always a pleasure.
And vaccinations have stalled in Saskatchewan. For the second day in a row, more people were diagnosed with COVID than received a shot. So as the caseloads hit new highs in that province, Amira Issa shows us how a summer of easing restrictions has many demanding a tighter grip on the reins once again. The lineup at the Saskatoon COVID testing site stretched out for blocks. Still, Aaron Janay felt it was important to take time off work and school to get his teenage son tested for his mild symptoms. In three of his several classes at school, he had been exposed to COVID last week. The classes were mostly unmasked, and of course we know vaccination rates a little low. Saskatchewan lifted just about all its COVID restrictions on July 11th. Cases have been rising steadily since then. This week, the province set a record for average new cases over a seven-day period. It's the worst it's been since the beginning of the pandemic, and vaccination rates have hit a new low, trailing all other provinces except Alberta. Experts warn the province is at a breaking point. ICU capacity is certainly being stretched. Healthcare is being stretched. Um, Saskatchewan, to me, is in a, certainly a, a predicament. If we run out of critical care capacity, if we run out of hospital capacity, then we're going to be in a situation where, you know, COVID or not, vaccinated or not, like we're going to be in a situation where we may have to decide, you know, who lives and who dies. There are concerns many more people could have COVID in Saskatchewan and that cases could be falling through the cracks. Contact tracing is now left up to individuals who test positive. In addition, they are not required to isolate. Dozens of people in Saskatoon gathered today to demand more action. But we are the majority. People who want science. Another protest is planned at the legislature in Regina tomorrow. In a statement, the government says it is monitoring the situation very closely and will respond accordingly with the chief medical health officer and public health officials. Omer Issa, CBC News, Regina. Maple Ridge's very own made it into the Baseball Hall of Fame today. From BC to Montreal to Colorado, Larry Walker was in Cooperstown. We take you there next. And at 6.41, you're looking at a live shot at the Georgia Strait from the Tynamara Resort in Parksville. Beautiful shot, cooler days ahead, but still plenty of sun. Johanna breaks it down next. So wolf dogs are canines that have some level of wolf and some level of dog content mixed into them. They're actually bred for people by people. They don't happen naturally very often. And so that means that they're just not suitable for typical domestic lifestyle. Well, the animals that you see here are staying here and they're living out their lives. They come to us from all sorts of different situations, rescue situations, transfers from other organizations or owner surrenders is a large one that we have here too. Last October, we had 10 wolf dogs come to us from a rescue situation. So that increased our numbers to 35 resident wolf dogs. So it costs about $10 a day to feed each wolf dog. And we have 35, so that's about $350 per day just in food costs themselves. So that's a lot of food. <laughs> it's a lot of raw meat every single day. The wolf dogs here do get a raw meat based diet and it's about 2% of their body weight every day. So in the summer, that means about a pound, a pound and a half to three pounds per animal. And then in the winter, as we start getting to these cooler seasons, we're gonna actually start increasing the amount that they get fed just because they are a lot more active with the cooler temperatures. It's a long-standing relationship as an organization. We feel like people that can should um, uh, contribute and be part of their community. The product that we serve is in the top 1% of uh, commercially available beef. The donation today was just slightly under 300 kilos. Some of it is trim from uh, our butchery programs. Um, some of it is prime grade uh, cuts that uh, we just have access of in the restaurant. A lot of it is through the manufacturing and cutting process for us. 
the modern steak donations is going to definitely have a huge impact on feeding our wolf dogs and help covering some of that food costs so that we can put it to you know building enrichment structures or helping to build the enclosures and stuff like that so it definitely does make an impact to help sustain us for for the next few weeks we do see quite often wolf dogs still being bought today and sold to people who just don't have maybe all of the knowledge and resources and the full picture going into it. All we are trying to do is just help educate those owners or future prospective owners. These wolf dogs do require something different. It was a shocking threat. A Langley mosque told to close up, its residents told to move away, threatened with violence and death. Now the imam at the mosque is speaking out about the fear his community faces and the tough conversations he's having with his community and his family. We, we have to hide who we are. Um, a lot of our sisters who want to wear the hijab, um, you know, they don't wear it uh, out of fear that uh, somebody might attack them. And that's happened across the country. Uh, you know, single Muslim women have been, uh, or, or even walking in groups have been attacked, right? Um, so, so this is our reality, and, and it's not fair. Um, it, you know, we're not hurting anyone. We're not, uh, we're just asking to be, you know, just normal Canadian citizens. And, and a Canadian citizen is all about having your freedom. You know, freedom to practice and uh, freedom to preach, uh, freedom to speak, uh, freedom to walk without fear, um, freedom of walking on the street with your family without getting run over, right? These, these, these are things that we have to constantly carry on our shoulders and in the back of our minds. And, and our children do, uh, we do, and that's just because of who we worship and what we worship. It takes a toll. It takes a toll because you know, when a majority of the people can practice freely and our children were having to talk about being diligent and vigilant and, you know, making sure where it's okay to share who you are and where it's not okay to share, these are uncomfortable conversations that uh, we shouldn't have with our children. And, and, and unfortunately, it has its own set of repercussions and it's depressing. Uh, quite frankly, it's depressing. And our children have a lot of questions. Not only my own children, but children across the board have questions and, you know, we, we continuously tell them that majority of the people love you and there are some people who are ignorant and some people don't have enough knowledge. Some people are mentally deranged and that's why they do certain things like this, right? Um, but honestly, I, I wish we didn't have to have those conversations really sad and unfortunate and those conversations mm -hmm. uh, he's being forced to have are unfortunately taking place more and more in the Muslim community and other communities. Yeah, it's a powerful message uh, tonight, Anita, and I'm glad he uh, shared, shared his story with us. I do have uh, some positive news in the long range forecast. Uh, I know we're all wondering when fall is going to officially arrive across the South Coast. The 22nd is when fall officially begins, but I do have some fall weather around the corner. Let me start off with the current temperatures, uh, which is still feeling, which are still feeling very summer, like 22 right now at YVR, 24 out towards Abbotsford. Uh, we remain mild this evening, but 
as the sun uh, drops, uh, we're losing about two minutes of daylight every day. So starting to feel that chill in the evenings and the early morning hours will stay around the 10, 11 degree mark. Look at the latest satellite and radar shot. You can see the exiting high clouds from the system this morning and the approaching high clouds from the next system that will bring a few showers tonight. So check this out, or a few showers tomorrow afternoon, I should say. Tonight, just the overcast skies, pausing you at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. This model, uh, one of the ones that usually uh, so, sort of tracks our short range precip fairly well, the European model, not having the rain come down into our neck of the woods, possibly for North End, you can just see it starting across the North Coast through the day. But other models having that uh, rain dip down into Metro Vancouver for the afternoon hours, uh, right through to the end of the week. So it's sort of going to be teasing at Metro Vancouver as it slides up the West Coast. I'd say be prepared for a few showers for the first half of the day before things clear out. And we'll uh, keep a track of Friday's weather as well. Not out of the question. We'll have a few stray showers. Most of the system, though, will stay off the coast. You can see Port Hardy getting a good amount of rain till about your noon hour. Uh, Williams Lake showers in your afternoon and showers for Prince George as well. Quick look at those afternoon temperatures across the interior. Uh, coming down a couple of degrees as we head into the weekend. So below seasonal uh, to kick off the weekend and into early next week. And we have that cool down in our forecast as well behind that low. 23 tomorrow will still very warm, uh, feeling very much like the Wednesday afternoon we've had. Clearing out for Friday at this point, clearing out for Saturday and Sunday as well. Those are seasonal temperatures we're looking at. And earlier models had some rain and a good cool down coming in for next Tuesday. But Anita, starting to look like uh, we may get a bit of summer next week as well. The rain and the cool temperatures are coming, but uh, we keep pushing it back. I'm not complaining. <laughs> Me neither. Let's keep pushing <laughs> them back. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. It was an exciting day for Canadian baseball fans as one of our own was honoured in Cooperstown, New York. The pride of Maple Ridge, Larry Walker, has become the second Canadian inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Walker's career spanned 17 years, starting off in Montreal and making stops in Colorado and St. Louis. He was a five-time All-Star and the first Canadian player to win an MVP award. I honestly see myself as an average guy, and I'm good with average. I've lived my life trying to never get too high and never get too low. But to stand on this stage right now and tell you that I'm feeling average would be a complete lie. My feet have not touched the ground all day. Walker was selected on his 10th and final year of eligibility. The Hall of Famer says he shares this honor with every Canadian. Also inducted today was Yankees great Derek Jeter. Now to another Canadian impressing on the world stage. Just weeks ago, Montreal tennis player Leila Fernandez wasn't really on a lot of people's radar. Her rise at the U.S. Open catching many by surprise. Alison Northcott with how years of hard work have prepared Leila for the most important match of her career yet. Last night, another win for Canadian Leila Fernandez, another step in her remarkable rise in the tennis world. I always knew like she, she had it in her. Like, Love star Alexis is also a Quebec tennis player and a friend of Fernandez. Some people used to say, oh my gosh, she's so crazy for training so much. Like it's not gonna, it's not gonna lead to anywhere, but she's just proved that the exact opposite. Fernandez started playing tennis in Montreal. Her father says she's worked tirelessly from the start. After some early setbacks, he promised to stand by her and started coaching her himself. I said, OK, well, I'm going to put my money where, where my mouth is and I'm just going to learn about this sport and I'm going to study it and study everything and everyone. And, you know, I'm going to see what it takes you know, to make it to the top. He told me to go out there, have fun, fight for every ball, fight for every point. That fight and her grit have paid off. I remember being on the court with her. She must have been 11, and I was really impressed even then by her ability to take the ball so early. And that's been her signature. That's been her trademark, this ability she has to go on the court day in and day out and go at it full out. As the 19-year-old prepares to play the U.S. Open semifinal tomorrow, so many fans are behind her. What she's doing on center stage is going to resonate 
The Filipino-Canadian Tennis Association of Saskatchewan is planning a viewing party to cheer on Fernandez, who is of Ecuadorian and Filipino descent. There is someone that can make it, that can, that can change the, that get the crowd to really rally behind her. And by seeing a Filipina face in there, um, she's going to inspire a lot of people. To and he says the fact that another Canadian player, Felix Auger Aliasim, is in the men's final adds even more to the excitement. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. She became the face of Canada at the Paralympics. Swimmer Orly Rivard is back in Canada now. How she was greeted is next. We are so excited to be releasing this video today. Uh, it's been a couple of months now waiting to, to get it out to everybody. I guess back in the uh, late spring when we decided to do this video, we wanted something um, that our young singers could get excited about, something that was upbeat, energetic, um, and something that you know could give them a common purpose so that you know they they had something to work towards at the end of the year. Usually we would have a spring concert, which unfortunately didn't happen this year due to the pandemic. One of the things we talked about was in difficult times having a purpose helps you and you know we all feel that what we were doing was really important so that for the families, for the kids, they actually had something positive to work towards. They had something exciting. They had something that would help them realize that this is just a snapshot in time. And we picked this song, Ordinary Day, because it's so energetic. Uh, it, the message is about, you know, resilience and, you know, at the end of the day, we, you just have to say it's all right. It kind of just gives that message to our, our kids that, you know what, at the end of the day, it is going to be okay. In this beautiful life, there's always some sorrow. It's a double-edged night, but there's always tomorrow. We did have one older choir boy, yes, uh, um, his name is Little Alan, uh, yes, and he joined us for the uh, video, which was, you know, such a treat. Um, it kind of came when we first decided to do Ordinary Day, we reached out to Alan and asked if it would be okay if, if we uh, were to get Leslie, uh, Leslie Hayes to arrange a choral version of the piece, and he, you know, he was great with that. Um, and then a little while after, I kind of snuck in, well, how would you like to have a solo and join us? And he was so, you know, so gracious and came on board. He, he met with the kids, talked about the song a little bit, um, sang his solo, and he actually got to sing a duet in the uh, song with his son. So that was also very special as well. So, uh, you know, he, uh, he was our newest choir member uh, and definitely the most energetic choir member that we had. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. September is Literacy Month. Have fun and support the cause by joining CBC Vancouver's Dan Burrett at the Virtual Team Trivia Challenge. Register and learn more at dakota.ca. And join CBC Vancouver's Angela Sterrett at the Ravens Feast Gala and Art Auction, a virtual art and culture experience in support of the Bill Reed Gallery. Get tickets and learn more at billreedgallery.ca. 
Coralie Rivard is back in Quebec after swimming to five medals in Tokyo. The Paralympic champion was the most decorated Canadian there. But as Douglas Gellivan reports, Rivard's journey to Olympic glory wasn't easy. <laughs> Orly Rivard says airport security was perhaps the only downside to reaching the podium five times in Tokyo. The staff was a little surprised just how much metal she had in her carry-on. In addition to winning two gold, one silver and two bronze medals at the Paralympics, Rivard set two world records, one in the 100 meter freestyle and another in the 400 meter freestyle. I'm even more proud with, you know, the journey than the result. We were not the priority during this, this pandemic. So uh, I, I lost my coach for six weeks. He wasn't allowed in the pool. Like I had to train in the free swimming laps with the public. Uh, I had to own a coach myself. Uh, I was out of the pool for three and a half months. What makes Rivard's performance even more impressive is the resiliency she showed after her first event ended in disappointment. With no fans in the pool, she was far from her best in the 50 meter freestyle and failed to defend the gold she won in the event five years earlier in Rio. She said afterward, she even considered calling it quits. It just shows me that I'm a little stronger than I thought I was. Rivard now has 10 Paralympic medals. I hope that it, anyone who saw me, saw us, any Canadian athletes, just know that um, they're not alone. There's hope. There's a bright future for everybody that has a difference. And I hope that it encouraged them to pick up swimming or any kind of sport. She says she's still evaluating if she will attempt to return for more medals in Paris in 2024. Douglas Gellivan, CBC News, Montreal. Just incredible to watch. What a champion. All right, thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. Just a reminder, we will not be on tomorrow night because of the English language debate for this federal election. But you can watch that debate right here in place of our show. Have a good night.